and Sunday night we go through the scriptures. Um, so tonight we find ourselves in Ezra chapter 4. Um, so if you turn there, just a couple of comments before we get started. Um, I've, <clears throat> I've been traveling and I've missed a couple Sunday nights in a row, so I, um, I missed the conclusion of Sunday night services completing the whole Bible the other uh, week before last or two weeks ago. I uh, guess it was the week before Labor Day. But uh, you are all to be commended for your faithfulness uh, to go through the Scriptures chapter by chapter and verse by verse on Sunday nights. And um, yeah, I'm just very, very tickled that God uh, saw fit to allow us to get all the way through them. And, and also to get started again in a new one. Um, so we are uh, started again uh, to go through the Scriptures again chapter by chapter, and we will continue to do that as long as God would have us do it. Um, been a great, uh, just a great run, and so I'm, uh, I'm very, very tickled about that. Um, and I'm tickled too about the book we're in. Ezra is a great book. It comes at a very timely um, book for us, I think, um, in where we find ourselves as, um, as individuals in Christ and uh, brothers and sisters, and also where we find ourselves as a nation currently. Um, so I think it is a very timely book in that respect. So if you are at Ezra chapter 4, let's uh, open the service in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, you are um, truly a, a great and awesome God. Father, you are King of kings and Lord of lords, and your word, um, Father, is true. Father, your word is proven. Um, your word has been proven over and over through every science, Father, that uh, man knows. And so, Lord, we are just in awe of you for that. Father, we're in awe of you for your faithfulness to your promises, Father. We're in awe of you of your, just your love and your grace and your mercies that are new every day. And so, Lord, tonight we give ourselves to learn more about you. We ask that your Holy Spirit would walk amongst us, that would fill each of us, Father, that we um, might just draw a little closer to you tonight through your word. I thank you so much, Father, for the faithfulness of these that have come and given of their time to learn more of you. I pray, Father, you would bless them for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So Ezra um, is, the, is the first book that deals with the uh, chronology or, or kind of the, the return of the children after their uh, deportation um, to Babylon, really, for the... Um, the last two tribes that were deported, ultimately the destruction of Jerusalem that occurred under Nebuchadnezzar, um, and as was prophesied by um, Jeremiah um, and related to us through the book of Daniel that there was uh, 70 years um, assigned to the children of Israel to be outside the land, and they, they had been, um, and they were deported. And God's promises are faithful, though, and that's what we saw in chapter 1 of this book was just the faithfulness of God that at the 70 years that he would raise up Cyrus and Cyrus would allow the people, give the edict that would allow the people to return to Jerusalem. And uh, that is no small miracle. And I think the, the lesson for us out of chapter 1 was just that, that God's, God's um, word is true. God's promises you can bank on and they are always fulfilled. Um, without exception, God's promises have been fulfilled. His promise um, that he would raise up Cyrus uh, was, is well documented. It was prophesied um, hundreds of years in advance of Cyrus even being born, some 160 or 170 years in advance of that. And God raised up that man. He became king and ruler to have the authority to allow the children of Israel to be restored to the land, and that is, um, and to rebuild their temple, and that is an incredible thing. So, um, you pick out scriptures as you read through the Bible, and you look at them, you wonder, is that promise true for you? I tell you, it is. That God is faithful to His promises, um, without without fail. Um, chapter two was a genealogy of those that came. We saw that there was nearly fifty thousand that God raised up to come back to Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple under Cyrus's edict. Um, that is a tremendous thing. Uh, we see the, the main character of this first portion of Ezra there in Zerubbabel. 
Uh, Zerubbabel was the grandson of Je Jehoiakim, um, also known as Jeconiah, who was um, and essentially um, he was an ancestor of David. So uh, Zerub Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, excuse me, um, sorry about that. Uh, he, uh, he had this unique place and he was um, of the royal family and his father had not been one that had followed after God. In fact, he was shown to be uh, or demonstrated to be um, that he did not follow God. And so he was not a favored king, but he was, I think, the second to the last king um, just prior to their deportation to uh, Babylon. But he comes back, and in chapter 3, we see that they're back in the land, and they start. And it's very, very encouraging there in the first portion of chapter 3 where they, um, it says in verse um, 2, then Jeshua, the son of Je Josadak, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerub Zerubbabel, the son of Shatil, and his brethren, arose and built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it. Um, and it says there in verse uh, 2 or 3, without my glasses, um, though fear had come upon them, that'd be verse 3, because of the people of those countries, they set the altar on its bases and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening burnt offerings. So the, the significance of that cannot be overstated, that the first thing that they did was they set up the altar. And they did so in the presence of the people that had come into the land and had occupied the land for that 70 years. And we'll see more of that today in Ezra 4. But in Ezra 3, the first thing they did was set up that altar. And the purpose was clear, is that they were going to and they were uh, needing to and desired in their hearts to first make sacrifices to the Lord, to first to establish and reestablish that relationship with God. No doubt that they were... Um, you know, had been longing, this 50,000 people who would make a 900-mile journey to come back to Jerusalem, 900, um, 900 miles, nine months likely is what it would take to come back, a trip of nine months. Um, they had to be dedicated to the things of God. And the first thing they wanted was to establish and reestablish that relationship. And that is so important, such a strong lesson for us is the importance of relationship. God, that's what God desires with us. That is the reason why we are saved, is that we would have that relationship. For us, it is a uh, certainly salvation issue, um, certainly an eternity issue, but it is most importantly a relationship issue, and that Jesus Christ desires a relationship with each of us, and that is so important, and such an important thing that the first thing that they do when they come back out of captivity is um, build the altar. It is not about works, right? It is not uh, about their service. No doubt that is important, and everything that we are called to do in our service for God is important, but more important than service is relationship. And uh, that altar and establishing it there in chapter 3, verse 3, um, was uh, we should not lose the significance of that. Now, in chapter 4, as we start, um, it, is, uh, it takes a turn, right? And so here it is, chapter 4, verse 1. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity, captivity were building the temple of the Lord God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do, and we have sacrificed to him since the days of Ezar Haddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. And so here's the, um, the actually the, the heading on, in my Bible, this portion of Scripture is the resistance to rebuilding the temple. And this is the resistance of, of the people who were living in the land to the people, um, the Jews who had come back out of captivity to reestablish the temple when we get this insight into this resistance that they face. Keep in mind as we, as we study this uh, portion of Scripture that the people who were left in the land by Nebuchadnezzar were the poor. 
right? He left just very few of them. If you recall from our studies in First Samuel, uh, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, what occurred was there were three deportations um, by Nebuchadnezzar when he came into power. He had to come back. Uh, not once, not twice, but he came back a third time, and the third time he uh, desecrated the temple. He tore it all down. He, he, burned it to, he essentially burnt the ground, um, and he was uh, obviously very, very uh, upset that he had to come a third time, um, and he, he left, the, he just destroyed it, and he left only the very, very poor just to tend to a couple of farms, um, and that's it. But what had occurred in northern kingdoms, the ten tribes who had been overtaken by Assyria, is that the um, Nebuzardan or his predecessors had sent them back into the land. He'd send Assyrians to occupy the land. When he took the Israelites out, he sent the Assyrians in, and they established um, themselves in the land, and they brought their gods with them. And so there was a time, and actually in, in Scripture, um, there's a time when um, God uh, sends lions, mountain lions, to them, and they were destroying the people, and the people were concerned. Did, you know, what do we do about this land that you've given us? Um, can you send us a priest of the God of this land so that we can learn how to deal with it? And so they did, and there were no good priests, right, in, in the northern kingdom. They had those that were of the ten tribes that were of good godly character had come back and had worshipped in Judah, and so along comes um, this, uh, an ungodly priest, although a Jew, um, and he gives them instruction and they learn to abide in the land. But they brought all their gods with them. And then ultimately they intermarried with the few Jews that were left. And pretty soon they uh, established what we become and we learn at the time of Jesus is referred to as the Sumerians, right? And they are a type and they were despised by the Jews, uh, we know that from the New Testament teachings on them. They, they despised the Sumerians. They would walk around. They would avoid them. Um, and they wanted nothing to do with them. And they, um, in doing that, or they, the Jewish people believed that they were half-breeds, that they were half Assyrian. They were outsiders who had married into Jewish families, and therefore they, they brought with them their gods, and so they had this mixed relationship, the mixed multitude. You sometimes see it referred to um, in scripture and in studies. And that's who they were dealing with. And so these people now come to these, um, the people of Judah and Benjamin, as it says there, the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin. Make no mistake about it, that word adversaries is not um, coincidental that um, the Holy Spirit sought to use it here. For every good work that we would have commenced upon um, as faithful Christians, as lovers of God, the one true God, comes with an adversary, right? The adversary, our adversary, the devil, you know, as we know from elsewhere in Scripture, seeks um, whom he may destroy, right? He's constantly looking for whom he may destroy, uh, may destroy. and for every good work that is commenced, there is uh, a corresponding reaction by our adversary, the devil, and this is no different. And I think it's, it's not coincidental that the Holy Spirit uses that word here. The adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the uh, descendants of the captivity were building the, the temple of the uh, Lord God of Israel. That's, that's what they do. They heard and they came. And this is, this is what we, um, where we find ourselves uh, at this account. And I think it's a very important account that we understand. That virtually you cannot do a work of God without an adversary. Anything you set out to do that there is an adversary, you're going to get the attention of Satan. You're going to get the attention of the, day, of the devil and his emissaries. They do not want to work. And this has commenced since Eve and Adam occupied the land. Right? We're going through Genesis and the men's study on Saturday mornings now, and it's just a great study and a reminder of um, just this adversary that we have. And virtually anything you step out to do for God, there will be an adversary. They will come against you. It, it's, typically, it's immediately, but not always. Typically, but it is always without fail. 
right? Ultimately, you would be confronted with it. And um, it is because we have uh, gotten the attention of the adversary. If we seek to do anything in uh, any work for God, we should expect that. And this is, um, this is true. And it's been true since, again, Eve. It was true at the time of Paul in 1 Corinthians 16.9. It says, for, and Paul speaking, for a great and effective door has opened to me, um, and there are many adversaries to it. And that is true. There are things that come up. There are, um, and there's, uh, many times they're just very, very subtle. Sometimes they're direct, um, and they're in your face like this one is. And other times they are very subtle. Some of them are just psychological. Um, at, um, things that we deal with that um, uh, affect our ability to carry on the things that God has for us. Notice it says here that they, were, um, they found out the descendants learned that, or excuse me, the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord, and they came to him in the heads of the father's house and said to them, let us build it with you, for we seek your God as you do. And we have sacrificed to him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. So this is the way they, they take this approach, is that we serve the God you serve, right? We believe in your God. Let us help you. And clearly the people that were there, the children of Israel, of Judah and Benjamin, as this, the scripture says, they needed the help right? They could have used a few extra hands to do the work. And so these people of the land, they come and they say, we worship the same God you do, right? Why can't, why can't we help? Let us help you. And uh, it, is a, it is a very, very tempting thing to do, is to allow the people of the world to come in and participate in your ministry and the things that God has called you to do. Or to allow yourself to get aligned, you know, perhaps uh, unintentionally, but uh, to get yourself aligned with the people of the world just by your actions is a very, very dangerous thing. And it is something that we as leadership in Calvary here are very careful about. We have an instance right now that the board has been praying about um, that is very much on point um, of this, a ministry that we have supported fa faithfully for decades seems to have allowed um, themselves to be assimilated, much like this uh, is here. Um, and so we are praying as a board as whether or not we're going to continue to be able to, to um, support that ministry. And, but it is a very um, subtle thing that the, um, our adversaries will do. Um, and they use in this instance an assimilation, right? Let us, let us uh, participate with you. Again, these guys were um, Assyrians that were imported. They ultimately became the Sumerians. They were considered at the time of Jesus to be mixed breed. The Jews had wanted nothing to do with them. You see it here that they were very careful. They had married Jews. They had brought their gods with them. And essentially that always brings compromise. We saw it as we learned and, and we watched Solomon's life, right? And he started off so strong for God. And of course, he was the son of David, and, and yet he, he went and he married 700 wives. You know, some would say, arguably, he did so in part out of wisdom, right? So he could align himself with other kingdoms and avoid uh, wars, which he was successful in doing. But spiritually, what it did to the nation was destroy it. It ultimately fed the seeds of where the nation would get separated under his son Rehoboam, Right? And Jeroboam splitting off. And it was because, in large part, because Solomon had allowed himself to assimilate with others, other nations, other ungodly people, and it destroyed the nation of Israel. And so it is, um, it is very much that way. And that's what occurs. Again, that, that it introduces um, false gods. It is very much like the Jews complained to the Samaritans. They're half-breeds. They're not totally devoted to the things of God, and it results in compromise. And this goes on all the time in ministry. Always. It is prevalent throughout the uh, ministries we see. And we've seen, um, just in my lifetime, we've seen very many established ministries get persuaded and moved 
um, into a direction where they get aligned with God. And what are the risks of that? Well, the risk is, is now all of a sudden you no longer have your witness, right? There's not a fine line between, there, there is a, a blurred line between what is of God and what is of um, the other, uh, the worldly organization that you may have gotten assigned with. This ecumenical movement occurred um, not that long ago here in the United States where all these pastors were getting together, the Catholics and the Lutherans and you know, the Mormons, and, and they were all this big ecumenical movement. And um, it is very tempting to align yourself, and I mean in brotherly love, to, to allow yourself to get associated with that. But Calvary as a group overall, many of them avoided it and held strong um, to the discipline of um, just relying and serving God and God through His Word and relying on His Word and not allowing ourselves to get caught up into that. There's a great bumper sticker out, and every time I see it, it just makes me cringe. And it's called Coexist. Maybe you've seen it. And it has all of the different, uh, or not all of them, but many different religious um, symbols, right? It has um, the sickle for Islam. It has um, certainly a cross for Christianity. It has the Jewish star. And the idea is, and, and this is kind of prevalent in our culture, is that can't we all just get along? Really? Don't you really all just serve the same God? Right? There's only one God, right? There's only, we have these monotheistic real, uh, religions, Christianity, Jew, or, excuse me, um, Jewish religion, and certainly Islam. They're all monotheistic, right? They all have one God. So isn't it the same God? I mean, this has been recent, not, not years, not decades, certainly, that this uh, has come up recently in our culture is, come on, right? There's, there's one God. You all serve the same God. Can't you guys just get along? You know, couldn't we just have world peace, right? There's really no difference in those religions. And the person who says that has done no depth of study about the truth of religion. There is very definitive differences between those religions. For instance, our friends the Jews, they believe in the same God we do, but they do not believe Jesus Christ is the Messiah. They're still looking for their Messiah. Christianity, we believe, of course, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Right? And he, he was born and he uh, fulfilled all the prophecies of Scripture. He died on a cross and, to save us from our sins and he rose again on the third day. He is the Messiah. The Jews do not believe that. Some of you know from uh, uh, some of the comments that have been made by uh, Pastor Dan when he was here that I got into a, uh, an unwittingly and um, I thought relatively innocently a little discussion at the uh, Temple Institute in Jerusalem. When I asked the priest, I just said, what, I mean, and I was a relatively young believer, but I just said, what, what is your guy's problem with Jesus? You know, it was a nice, innocent question, but Oh, the wrath came down on me, right? They got a big problem with Jesus. They are not the same. They are not the same religion. We love our Jewish friends, and we know that they love God. They just have not recognized their Savior. And Islam is totally different altogether. Again, they do not believe in Jesus Christ either. Um, they believe in Muhammad. So they're, the people who believe this, that you know, we all serve one God, they're just wrong. Um, John chapter 14, verse 6 says, uh, Jesus speaking, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If we would just hold that as a group of Christians, just hold that verse near and dear to our heart and test every other religion by that one statement, what do they do with the claims of Christ? Christ claims, rightfully, and proven again over and over and again in our scriptures that there is no one comes to the Father except through Him. You're not coming through Israel. You're not coming through another Messiah sometime later. Either you believe this or you do not, and you are not aligned with us as Christians. And it is an important thing that we understand that. But that's what they, these people first try to do. They try to assimilate it here back to our scriptures is, they try to assimilate with us, right? And, they, um, and by doing so, it it's, seems so innocent, right? Here, we're here to help. We believe in the same God you do. But no, and what is the problem with it? 
You know, what would be the problem of those guys just lending a hand, right? Bringing a shovel, you know, maybe their own picks and helping. Well, the problem is it's a, it has the appearance of that we are one. That we do hold the same things um, at the uh, same priorities. And the reality is we don't. Right? So it, it has a, it's a false appearance. Now, can we love them? Absolutely. Are we called to love them? Clearly. Right? Scripture demands that we love one another, but there is a difference and there is an appearance of commonality that occurs when you associate yourself with someone from the world. And so we are just dogmatic about being careful to whom we associate with. And it is, it really is a dividing line in many respects. And friendships, perhaps you've had friendships. When you claim a relationship with Jesus Christ, you are going to be confronted by your adversary as to are you going to continue to hang with your old friends who aren't? And the answer is, is you better be careful because that assim assimilation, that appearance can be um, detrimental to your walk. The other thing that occurs here is it really, really causes confusion. So of all those people that are there, the 50,000 um, people who are um, the true people of Judah and Benjamin that have come back now from uh, the captivity in Babylon, and they're there to set up their altar, and they're to offering sacrifices, and now they see that, oh, the nations that are around them who are pagan, who have make pagan sacrifices and other altars, and, and here they see them together. What is that common Jew going to think? That the, it's okay? It's okay if they, they help here, and it, it, well, if it's okay if they help there, is it okay if we go help them with their pagan sacrifices? The answer is no. You can't. It's not right. And that causes confusion in the people. Terrible thing. And, um, and we lose people because of it. Um, it's just a, a horrible thing. There is a difference. Um, the, the, uh, the presumption of people when they see that going on is that there is no difference in religious beliefs. But in truth, there are. And so we are very, very careful about that um, to avoid that confusion. And we should not compromise with the world. God, has, God had called these people to come back through Cyrus. And again, the prophecy was very clear that it would be Cyrus. It was before he's born. He comes into power, and what's he do? God puts it upon his heart, and he gives the edict that allows those people to come back. And Cyrus had a mind different than um, the ruler of Assyria, where he sent his own people back into the land to... Um, occupy it and to settle it really um, and they brought their gods of course with them Cyrus had the belief as he returned and restored the people who had, he, uh, who had been taken out that they would have a loyalty to Cyrus right? They would, they would recognize him as having done a good thing and they would be relatively loyal to the king and so that was Cyrus's uh, perhaps mental um, gymnastics that he went through to make that decision, but it was impressed upon him by God, no doubt, and he sends the people back. And, um, and it was important that they do it, uh, and they come back. So the, uh, so then you, you get into verse 3 here. Take a look at what the reaction is. Verse 3 says, But, and again, I, I love that word, right? It is the great conjunction. But, Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the father's house of Israel said to them, you may do nothing with us to build a house for our God, but we alone will build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus the king of Persia has commanded us. And so that is their response. Um, praise God for Zerubbabel, right? Praise God for strong leaders. You will do nothing of that. You will have nothing to do with it. And it seems 
you know, and superficially as we read through this, and you casually read through it, and you say, oh, geez, what's the big deal, right? Again, they needed the help. They could have used a few extra shovels and picks, maybe a donkey, donkey or three. You know, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is just exactly what we went through a few moments ago, right? It's the assimilation. It's the appearance. It's the confusion it causes. And so that's the big deal. And thank God for strong leadership in Zerubbabel and the other leaders that he said, you, you know, you will not have anything to do with it because of that very thing. And he, he gives them, you know, the two, two primary reasons. He, they, he professionally, I would say, he carefully told him no. And here's why. Number one, God called us to do this. God called us at the direction um, of Cyrus, or with the permission of Cyrus, better. God called us to come and reestablish the temple. And Cyrus gave us that permission. And he has commanded us, not you, right? And I wonder out loud in reading through this, and I wonder out loud, if, if you thought you were serving the same God, how come you didn't build the temple? Right? That would be a good, that might have been a little too much in your face kind of um, reaction to their question is how come we can't help? Well, you've been here for 70 years. You could have started, but you didn't. Right? And it's, a, it's just so important that we have strong leadership. And it is essential in God's work. I, we have been, um, I would say, very, very blessed here at Calvary Carson, Carson Valley, or excuse me, Calvary Chapel Carson Valley, to have strong leadership. And that leadership has commenced. I have served under um, three pastors um, here. I miss Joe, or I miss, uh, Joe Valenzuela by um, a period of months. Um, otherwise, it would have been all four of them that had, had founded this church. And I am... Um, I'm grateful for the leadership. I'm most grateful that the leadership in Calvary Chapel, Carson Valley, is dedicated to God's Word and the teaching of God's Word simply and straightforwardly. I've sat on the board in this um, church, um, oh, golly, for a long time, over three decades. I've been privileged to um, see the inner workings and see the decision process and some of the things that have occurred that have just been heartbreaking. And I've seen some of the great victories. The radio station. I've been part of the radio. Uh, you know how we got started in the radio station, how the school got started, and some of the other great ministries we have. It has just been a tremendous run. But I, it has not been without adversaries. You know, we're going to see, and I'll give you an example here in a few minutes about this petition that they write back to the king. Right? We had a petition of all the neighbors that live around here. There were some. I think there were over 200 neighbors that lived around here that when we decided and God opened the door that we could buy this lot and we needed a special use permit, there were over 200 neighbors of adversaries who did not want us here. The word got out that we were going to plant a church right here in the largest community, fourth largest community in um, the state of Nevada. And the word got out and the adversaries came out in 200 signatures on a, 200 plus signatures on a petition. And it was uh, God's graciousness that he opened the door for this special use permit. But I, again, all of that is just great stuff. But what is key to understand is strong leadership is critical. And Zerubbabel was that guy. And he said, no, we won't do it. We, and we get confronted with it more than you know about just the opportunity to associate, to be assimilated with, and I am just so grateful and thankful for the leadership in this church that says no. And we have been perceived and been criticized in the community for being very, very, um, almost isolationist. That is the furthest thing from the truth. We very much embrace, and we are excited about all the good work, and there are some great works going on in Carson Valley. I believe the people in Carson Valley are without excuse. I mean, we have some great pastors at other churches that are teaching God's Word faithfully, um, just as we do day by day here. Um, we, are, we are anything but isolationists, but we are very, very careful in the leadership about not allowing ourselves to be assimilated with the world. 
and be very careful and very sensitive about those things that get presented, and they, again, they get presented regularly, just like here. These people come to him and say, couldn't we just help? We just want to help. And it sounds so good, and it sounds so easy, and it'd be so easy just to accept it, but it takes a strong leader to say, as Zerubbabel did, no, you will have nothing to do with building the, uh, the temple of our God, right? Our God is not your God, and make no mistake about it. And he was strong, and he was professional about it, but that's what he did. So what is the reaction <clears throat> that they get? It says here in verse 4, then the people of the land, and, and I love this, and this is how the adversary works, right? I'm your friend here. You tell me no, watch this. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So, we, uh, so that now we see their true heart, right? And it, their true heart is that they were going to do three things. First, they tried to discourage him and persisted in it. You'll never, that'll never happen. You'll never finish the work, right? What makes you think that you are um, able and you're doing God's will to build this temple and starting with the altar? <sighs> Why don't you build the walls around it first? You know, that type of discouragement. Just questioning the, the call of God in their lives. And they troubled them in building. Probably stole some things from them from time to time. So they would frustrate them. And that's the third thing. They would frustrate their purposes wherever they could. And that's what the enemy does. Discourages, troubles, frustrates, anything they can do to dissuade you from staying after and keeping focused on the thing that God, God has called you to do. Um, and it is, it is so true. But you see these, the true color of these people um, and how they have... Um, they were falsely asking to help. They had no intention of helping. If they had intention of helping, they wouldn't have done these things, right? And so they, they try to, uh, to dissuade them. They try to stop them from their, their calling. And honestly, people, they are very successful at that, as we're going to see. And people around you will be successful if you are not totally committed to the calling that God has in your life the people around you will dissuade you from doing it, from fulfilling that call, from doing the things that God has asked you and put upon your heart to do. And it is a very dangerous thing. And it's important that we recognize it. And thank God that right here in Ezra chapter 4, God presents it to us in a way that is just stark, right? First they want to help, and now they want to tear down. And that is what happens. Um, take my word for it. And it'll be a, a, a strong disassociation when you make these. You, when you make that strong decision, when that strong leader says, no, I'm going to be, uh, commit myself to the purposes of God, and this is what we're going to do. And then there's all of a sudden, there's that opposition, and people are going to separate. And now, now you look like the bad guy. And as somebody who's been part of the decision process to be the bad guy, and in, even in my own business, um, or businesses been the bad guy, it's, it's not fun. It's not comfortable. It's not easy. But it is very, very necessary. And it's very important that we not compromise. And we're careful about who we associate with. And we are careful who we assimilate with. You know, you, uh, Joey's a hard worker. Pastor Dan was a hard worker. Um, they both are committed to being here on Sunday mornings to teach. And that, that, is, the, uh, that is the public-facing um, ministry, right, of this church. It's Pastor, Pastor Joey now. But also understand this. Nobody gets to stand here in the pulpit unless they're vetted by the leadership in the church, senior pastor primarily. And the reason is that we are very, very careful about who we allow the opportunity to speak here. 
or it was the circumstances um, of someone who had been here many, many times, and he seemed to have taken, um, and he had taught here, he'd taken a turn to the right or to the left, depending on your um, worldview, and uh, he got into some things that were just, um, they weren't biblical in our estimation. They didn't follow what we understood and understand to be the clear teaching of God's Word. And it was, uh, it was a very difficult decision that Joey ultimately made. And he ran it by the board before he did, and we had to ask the, that person not to come, even though he'd been scheduled. Very, very difficult decisions, and it's hard, but it is so necessary and so important that it, it not be allowed to occur and allow confusion in the body. And it is rampant in these last days if people aren't careful. So you publicly facing ministry, very few people get the opportunity to stand here and they won't get the opportunity until they're vetted, primarily by the senior pastor. Dan was faithful about it. Joey's being faithful about it. It's really, really important. So these, uh, the opposition to them, um, they showed their true colors. They tried to discourage. They troubled them. And they frustrated them. Verses 6 through 23 is a, a parenthetical gr- verse or verses um, in this chronology, in this account. And it's uh, important that we see it and we understand it for that. It is not necessarily, um, well, it is not specific to the building of the temple. Rather, it deals more with the time of Nehemiah when they come back to build the Jerusalem. Okay? So it is. Um, it, it, I just understand that verses 6 through 23 are parenthetical. We've seen it a lot in, in Revelations where uh, the Holy Spirit through the writer would um, take a, and give us a, uh, the chronology would stop. There would be a parenthesis to give us more insight into certain aspects of it. And then, um, then the, the chronology would continue. So let's go through verses 6 through 23. It says, In the reign of Ahasuerus, In the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. And so this this is the the telltale point that we know that is, in fact, a parenthetical because it skips ahead to the reign of Ahasuerus. Right now, at the time of Cyrus, when they come back and they start to work, they are under uh, King Cyrus, right? And ultimately... King Cyrus would align himself with Darius the Mede and the Medo-Persian Empire would rule and then um, Darius would ultimately take over at the, uh, when Cyrus stepped down. But in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. In the days of Artaxerxes, also Bislam, Meredath, Tabel, and the rest of their company, companions wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia, and the letter was written in Aramaic script and translated into Aramaic, lang- or Aramaic language. Rehum, the commander, and Shimshai, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to King Artaxerxes in this fashion. And so here we have the letter, and uh, God saw fit to, to reproduce it here for us. It says, from Rehum, the commander, Shimshai, the scribe, and the rest of their companions, representatives of the Denonites, the Aphrasathites, the Tarpalites, the people of Persia and Erech and Babylon and Shushan, the Devites, the Elamites, and the rest of the nations whom the great and noble Osnapper took captive and settled in the cities of Samaria and the remainder beyond the river and so forth. So the introduction to this letter is, is uh, that they're writing is, is there's a whole bunch of us that have signed this petition that are opposed to what's and we're going to tell you why we're opposed to what they're doing in Jerusalem. This is a petition. And all these people are of one mind and one heart relative to this. And so that is uh, what they're essentially saying. And this is a copy of the letter they wrote him. To King Artaxerxes, from your servants, the men of the region, the region beyond the river, and so forth. Let it be known to the king that the Jews who came up from you have come up to us at Jerusalem and are building the rebellious and evil city and are finishing its walls and repairing the foundations. That's there in verse uh, 12. So again, this is how another indicator, another um, fact that uh, 
And why we know that this is a parenthetical passage is because they are complaining about that they're building, building the rebellious and evil city are finishing its walls, which at the time of Zerubbabel, they were working on the temple, not the walls of Jerusalem. Okay? So let it be known to the king that this city, if this city is built and the walls completed, they will not pay tax, tribute, or custom, and the king's treasury will be dis- diminished. Right? They know how to get to the heart of this. The king, you're not going to get as much money. Right? So it's about the money is the problem. Now, because we received support from the palace, that is, we're on the government payroll, and therefore, you know, it's going to cost you the same amount to have us be here, but you're going to have less revenue. So you're going to have less, less left over, is essentially what the math that they are doing for him. So because we received support from the palace, it was not proper for us to see the king's dishonor. Therefore, we have sent and informed the king that search may be made in the book of the records of your fathers. And you will find in the book of the records and know that this city is a rebellious city, harmful to the kings and provinces, and that they have incited sedition within the city in former times for which cause the city was destroyed. He's speaking specifically as Zerubbabel's grandfather, Jehoiakim, who rebelled against um, Nebuchadnezzar, and he was one of the reasons, one of the people that they, Nebuchadnezzar had to come back the third time. So and essentially it was a sedition against the ruler at that time, um, which again was uh, Nebuchadnezzar. So verse 16, it says, We inform the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls are completed, the result will be that you will have no dominion beyond the river. And then the king answers and says to Rahum, the commander, to Shimshai the scribe, to the rest of their companions who dwell in Samaria, and to the remainder beyond the river, peace, and so forth. The letter which you sent to us has been clearly read before me, and I gave the command, and a search has been made, and it was found that this city in former times has revolted against the kings, and rebellion and sedition have been fostered in it. Again, true statements, um, perhaps out of context, and, um, and uh, maybe even... Um, what we would call today, what would we call that today? We would call that um, not misinformation, we would call that fake news, right? <laughs> That's what we would call it. There have also been mighty kings over Jerusalem who have ruled over all the region. That's true. It would be David, Solomon, um, beyond the river, and tax and tribute and customs were paid to them. Very true. Now, given the command to make these men cease, that this city may not be built until the command is given by me. Take heed now that you do not fail to do this, why should damage increase to the herd of the kings? Now, the, when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letters was read before Rehum, Shimshai, the scribe, and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews and by force of arms made them cease. Again, made them cease building the walls of Jerusalem. Um, so a little bit um, ahead of time, I believe God included it here to give us an example of the things that the our adversaries um, and their adversaries would, would do. They were discouraging. They troubled them in building. They hired counselors to frustrate them um, in their purpose. And so letters like this, petitions that you would see, are the types of tools that our enemy would use against um, the people of God. And here, this is just an example of it for us to see firsthand. Continuing in verse 24, it says, Thus... The work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased, and it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. What you don't see here, and which is not uh, eminently obvious to a casual reader of this study, is between chapter 4, verse 24, and chapter 5, verse 1, is a period of 15 years. And during that period, the other... um, which you, what is not spoken of by Ezra, at least in, in this um, uh, portion of Scripture, is that the people, the opponents to the work were successful. And the work on the temple stopped. So we know from um, chapter 3 that they started with the altar and then they got started on the foundation um, of the temple walls 
and 15 years go, essentially this opposition comes against them and they stop building the temple for a period of 15 years. And it is, uh, it's a tragedy, honestly. It's a tremendous lesson for us of what happens when there is a call of God and the people quit too early. Let me say it again. There's a call of God. People take a step of faith and get started. The adversary, who undoubtedly is going to come, comes and interferes, attempts to discourage, attempts to trouble them, does frustrate them in the use of counselors and otherwise, and signing signatures on petitions, and ultimately they give up too soon. They stop the things that God has called them to do. And that's what happens. They get comfortable in their life, and uh, they decide it's really not that big a deal to have a temple, right? We can just go on about our life, and for 15 years, we can live without a temple. Or for an indefinite period of time, we can live without a temple. I mean, really, do we have to offer sacrifices and altars? We're back in the land. God's scripture, after all, has said we would only be out of the land for 70 years, and we're back. No, it's a tragedy. It's a horrible tragedy. When you have a call of God, there, there's a, a great scripture in Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. It says the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. They're irrevocable. The call that you have, that God has given you in your life to be about his business and to do those certain things, those, are, those gifts that he's given you in those callings are irrevocable. That means they persist. One of the most dumbfounding things to me as a, um, a Christian pastor, pastor is to watch people get saved and stop, right? The opposition comes, they get saved, they realize their need for a Savior, which is a tremendous thing, right? And we all know that by, by our scriptures that we're all given gifts, right? And they're to be used for God's purpose and God's glory. That is our purpose for living. And then to see people just stop, they were on fire for a time, and then they get dissuaded, right? Again, the same things occur that happened um, with the children of Israel. They get discouraged by their adversaries. They get troubled by them in, as they pursue those things. And then ultimately, um, they get frustrated with it, and they just stop. It's mind-numbing to me as a pastor to see that happen. It's, it's just it's incredible. And that's exactly what happened to these people. Five, chapter 5, verse 1. And we'll conclude here. It says, Then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophets prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel who was over them. So Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak, rose up and began to build the house of God which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, helping them. We, we haven't gone through Haggai, and we haven't gone through um, Nehemiah or Zechariah yet. Um, I, um, spoiler alert, I do think we are about to go through Haggai on Wednesdays, maybe. Or maybe even on Sundays. I can't remember. Joey, Joey gave me a little heads up that he might move that direction. But with uh, a little bit of a spoiler alert, what occurred in, in Haggai and Zechariah's prophecy is basically they said... Get back to work. What are you doing? The calling and the, the gifting of God are irrevocable. You were called, right? You stood strong, Zerubbabel. You stood strong against the enemy, and you said, no, you're not going to help us. But then what you did is you stopped. Get back to work, right? Wake up. Get on about the things God has asked you to do. And that is what the, pro that is what the prophecy will when we go into chapter 5 next week, we'll actually go look at this, um, Haggai's comments on um, this and his prophecy about it. But you've got to complete the work that God has given you to do. That is what we're up to. Now, what is that calling, right, in our lives? What are those things that God has asked us to do and to be after in, in our lives? Certainly, if you have children, it's raising your kids. And point them to Jesus Christ to be that witness and that example in their life. Um, I think it's one of the greatest callings we have. If you're married, to be 
that supportive and loving house, uh, spouse that points your spouse to Christ. Right? Those are simple things. And then there are the other things that God has called you to do. And we should be about those things. We should not allow ourselves to be dissuaded and discouraged in, the, in carrying on for God the things that he has clearly spoken to us and called us to do. We should be about those things. And it makes you wonder how much of God's work is stopped due to opposition, right? Because we give up too early. One of the, you know, just, uh, it's never give up. There's more work to be done. There's nothing in Scripture that you see that is uh, rewarded by God that people, where they just give up and they quit going hard after God. It just, it, you can't find it. Where God has blessed that. No, we need to, despite the opposition, press on to the high calling that God has in each of our lives. You have a call on your life. Your call is for a relationship, as we saw in chapter 3. First and foremost, a relationship with God. Be careful. Covet that relationship. Hold on to it dearly. And build upon it. And then in addition to the relationship, as you do that, in the, your service to God will come out. Right? And that, that service to God is equally as important is to be about the things that God would have you to do. You can't hear that statement from Christ when you get to heaven that says, well done, thou good and faithful servant, if you don't serve, right? It's just that simple. Relationship and service. Don't give up. Don't allow yourself to be discouraged by the enemy. God's call on your life, his gifting is without repentance. And it's irrevocable. If you have allowed yourself to stop, right? Maybe this, you got discouraged. Maybe, you know, the enemy, the adversary um, was, um, had a victory. I say to you, follow the, um, the prophet Haggai and get back to work. Get started again. If the calling and the gifting of God is irrevocable, then it's still there. Restore your relationship with Christ and get about the service that he's called you to do. That is the message from chapter 4 of, um, and the beginning of chapter 5 in Ezra. So, Joey, if you come close us in song, I'll close us in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, you are an awesome God. And um, we're just so grateful for your word, Father, how, how it guides us and directs us in each aspect of our life. Um, Father, we are... Um, Amongst all people, um, we are very blessed. Father, but with that blessing comes responsibility. And, and we recognize that as Christian men and women that are here tonight studying your word, Lord. Um, I pray, Father, that you would write these things upon our hearts as reminders. And for those of us that have allowed our relationship to fade uh, for whatever reason, Lord, I pray that you would just um, restore that relationship as only you can. That we would humble ourselves and and seek you, Lord, that our relationship would be renewed and encouraged. we'd be encouraged in that. And, Father, that we would be about the calling and the giftings that you have given us, Father. Those things, Lord, we would go hard after them again. Father, not for our glory, but for your glory. Father, the time is short. The harvest is ripe. The workers are few. Help us to be those workers, Lord, that are faithful to administer and to uh, pursue the callings that you've given each of us in our lives, Lord God. We do love you and praise you. We give you all the glory in advance. In Jesus' name, amen.